Okay. Today we're talking about things they carried and the last chapter, the lives of the dead. Now, I really like this chapter because it shows that O'Brien has been doing this, this idea of telling these true war stories and, and you know, kind of bringing people back by telling stories about them ever since he was a little kid, right? So the, the kind of way he does things with regarding the Vietnam War, he's been doing since he was a kid. So uh, page 225, uh, but this too is true, stories can save us. Now, if you remember a ceremony and it said, um, we don't have anything if we don't have the stories. I think storytelling is a really good theme that kind of runs through several of the books and there's two more coming up that we're not gonna get to, which they run through even more, but this really fits with it. I'm 43, year old, 43 year, years old now and a writer now, and even still right here, I keep dreaming Linda alive and Lavender too and Kiowa and Kurt Lemon and the slim young man I killed and the old man sprawled beside the pig pen and several others whose bodies I lifted and dumped into a truck. They're all dead, but in a story, which is a kind of dreaming, the dead sometimes smile and sit up and return to the world, right? Now, so it's talking about the, when he first got to Vietnam, the first beginning of his tour, on page 226, and it said uh, they went into a village, and it was a village that the, the Americans had already attacked. The place was deserted, no people, no animals. The only confirmed kill was an old man who lay face up near a pig pen in the center of the village. Now, uh, Dave Jensen went over and shook the old man's hand. How do you do, he said. One by one, the others did it too. They didn't disturb the body, they just grabbed the old man's hand and offered a few words and moved away. Rat Kylie bent over the corpse. Give me five, he said. Real honor. Pleased as bunch, said Henry Dobbins. I was brand new at war. to the war. It was my fourth day. I hadn't yet developed a sense of humor yet. Right away, I felt as if I'd swallowed something. Now, the reason they're doing this is to make it seem not quite so bad, right? They're going to do lots of tricks here to try to kind of not necessarily fool their brain into thinking things aren't so bad, but to just use different language to describe what's going on and react to it in a different way to make it not quite so painful. Right. If they got emotionally invested in every person that they saw that was killed in this war, their brain would break. Right. Or their emotions would break or something to that effect. I don't know exactly, but they're doing things to make it seem not so bad. On 227, um, it said, um, you did a good thing today, Kaiwa said. That shaking hands crap, it isn't decent. The guys will hassle you for a while, especially Jensen. But just keep saying no. Should have done it myself. Takes guts, I know that. It wasn't guts, I was scared. Kaiwa shrugged. Same difference. Now, if any of you are wanting to write the paper about bravery and cowardice or bravery and shame, that's a real good quote, right? Because we see this idea coming up. We see it in Up on the Rainy River. We see it in the dentist, and we also see it here. He said he was too scared to do it, right? But in Kaiwa's eyes, it looked like it was bravery because he was standing up for doing what was right, right? But he was doing it because he was embarrassed and ashamed, right? And so it's the same idea. Shame and bravery go hand in hand. Going on a little bit, on 228, then he brings up this. So after seeing this soldier, uh, the Viet me a soldier who was dead then he brings up a story from when he was a kid it sounds funny i said but that poor old man he reminds me of i mean there's this girl i used to know i took her to the movies once my first date kai would lean and looked at me for a long time then he leaned back and smiled man that's a bad date now i start on 228 we get this long story right if he was nine i've got a son who's nine right now he looks really young, right? In fourth grade, and trying to remember, I can remember some things about my fourth grade class. It was Miss Pearson's class, Mrs. Pearson's class. Um, I had glasses. Uh, you know, I remember some kind of bits and pieces of it, but that was a long time ago. I'm 42, so I'm almost as old as the, the writer of this. And that's a long time ago, man, to try to think back and remember the way things were. So this date he went on, you know, we see when he, at the end of the date when he uh, he and the and Linda are on the porch together, the little bits of details that he remembers from it. But this whole thing is made up, right? And because there's no way he could put the details together back from when he was nine. That was, you know, 34 years ago for him. Anyway, so they go out on this date, right? And on page 230, it said, and this is what I love. And I just, I hope that you take this from it because I think this is a wonderful sentiment. Um, as I said, it was in ceremony. Uh, if you've seen Coco, this is kind of a big point in that, a little bit, you know, more cultural significance in that one. But the thing about a story is that you dream it as you tell it, hoping that others might then dream along with you. And in this way, memory and imagination and language combine to make the spirits in the head. I think that's wonderful, right? Just the act of talking to someone when you think about it, which seems like such a basic activity, really, you're taking the things that are going on in here, using symbols that we've all agreed on, these little word things, and then putting that picture or that idea in someone else's head, right? Which is a pretty amazing thing when you think about it. And so uh, going on on 2.30, he gives an example of Ted Lavender, right? And Ted Lavender was a guy who took a bunch of 
painkillers and, and pills and stuff to stay calm and tranquilizers or whatever. And when he got killed, they start to do the same thing that Tim's going to do with, with Linda when she passes in a, in a moment. So on 231, it said, for a while, nobody said much. Then Mitchell Sanders laughed and looked over at the green plastic poncho. Hey, Lavender, he said, how's the war today? There was a short, quiet, mellow, somebody said. Well, that's good, Sanders murmured. That's real good, real good now. Stay cool now. Hey, no sweat, I'm mellow. Just ease back on then. Don't need no pills. We got an incredible chopper on, chopper on call. This once-in-a-lifetime mind trip. Oh, yeah, mellow. Now, in doing this, on the bottom of 231, that's what a story does. The bodies were animated. You make the dead talk and sometimes say things like, Roger that, or they say, Timmy, stop crying, which is what Linda said to me after they were, she was dead. So the, the soldiers are doing this with their fallen friend in the same way that Tim has done it. So basically, this is something that we all do, right? Even though he kind of coined this term about war specifically, we do a lot of things in our day-to-day -day lives, especially regarding death that he talks about here. Um... Now, talking about the, the movie they saw, The Man Who Never Was, and then he's going to refer to that as, as you know, as he's 43, kind of imagining a lot, uh, you know, nine-year-old Linda. He's She's basically a new person as he's created her, but she's still there, right? Now, we get the story uh, on page 233 of how that jerk Nick Veenhoff snuck up behind her. She was, a, she was suffering from cancer, and he pulled the hat off her head because she had been losing her hair because of chemo. And... Uh, O'Brien said, naturally, I wanted to do something about it, but it just wasn't possible. This is that bravery, shame stuff again. He feels like he should be brave enough to stand up and defend his, not girlfriend necessarily, but this girl he really likes by this jerk who's going to mess with her. I had my reputation to think about. I had my pride. And there was also the problem of Nick Viha. Going on a little bit. So they pull the cap off and she starts to cry. Go to 236. It's now 1990. I'm 43, year old, 43 years old, which would have seemed impossible to a fourth grader. And yet, when I look at my photographs of myself as I was in 1956, I realize that in the important ways, I haven't changed at all. I was Timmy then, and now I'm Tim, but the essence remains the same. I'm not fooled by the baggy pants or the crew cut or this happy smile. I know my own eyes. And there's no doubt that Timmy smiling at that camera is the Tim I am now. Inside the body or beyond the body, there's something absolute and unchanging. The human life is one thing, like a blade tracing loops on ice. A little kid, a 23-year-old infantry sergeant, a middle-aged writer knowing guilt and sorrow. And my friends, let me tell you this. You're 18 now. And it seems like you've got the whole rest of your life in front of you. I'm just going to say this to you. The next 18 years of your life are going to go by like that. The first 18 years took forever, right? Because that's the only 18 you've been on this earth. The next 18 are going to go really quick. And it won't be too long before you are my age, early 40s. And I know that seems ancient, just like as it does to Timmy in the book. You'll be surprised how unancient that is, right? Because you'll be there soon enough. And then when you do, when you look back at, at you know, you as a kid, little Nick, <laughs> I wasn't called Little Nick back then, but I was littler. I was, you know, 5'8 when I was born. Anyway, don't think about it too hard. Um, anyway, my mother passed away this year, right? My dad's still around. My brother's still here. But there aren't that many people who remember Kid Nick, right? Unless I tell stories about what I was like when I was a kid. Anyway, going on. <clears throat> um, on 237, <clears throat> so we get... The kids doing the same thing that the soldiers did here, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> on a September afternoon during noon recess, Nick Beanhoff came up to me on the school playground. Your girlfriend, he said, she kicked the bucket. At first, I didn't understand. She's dead, he said. My mom told me at lunchtime. No lie. She actually kicked the goddamn bucket. Now, kicking the bucket obviously is a euphemism for dying. Right. But we in our lives use all kinds of euphemisms to, for death, just like the soldiers in the book do. The soldiers, you know, if they walk across and see. You know, a kid, uh, uh, on here on 238, it said, shaking, uh, in Vietnam, we had our ways of making the dead seem not quite so dead. Shaking hands, that was one way. By slighting death, by acting, we pretended it was not the terrible thing it was. By our language, which was both hard and wistful, we transformed the bodies into piles of waste. Thus, when somebody got killed, as Kurt Lemon did, his body was not really a body, but one small bit of waste in the midst of a much larger wastage. I learned the words make a difference. It's easier to cope with a kicked bucket than a corpse, just like with Linda. If it isn't human, it doesn't matter much if it's dead. So if it's a Viet Cong nurse fried by napalm, she was a crispy critter. Now, those are hideous things. A Vietnamese baby which lay nearby was a roasted peanut. Just a crunchy munchy, Rat Kylie said as he stepped over his body. Now, they do that for the same reason that Nick uh, Wienhoff said, his mom said she kicked the bucket. A kicked bucket is easier to deal with than the death of a nine-year-old girl. Right? A crispy critter or a crunchy munchy as 
hideous as that is, what they, if they allow their brains and their minds to focus on things as they are in front of them, they go crazy. Because that's such hideous, monstrous things. And that's what war is about, unfortunately. We kept the dead alive with stories, right? Now on 239, we get this long page, all of these stories that he's telling of all that. We've read a lot of them, right? And every time we read them, they're happening. This is just like with Tayo. Every time he tells the story of the hummingbird and the butterfly, they're, they're happening right now, right? Every time he tells the story of Linda and he's skating, it's happening right now. And even him telling about when he was 43, because this book came out, I don't know, 20 years ago. So he's probably in his 60s now. He's recreating 43-year-old Tim for us. And 43-year-old Tim, the writer of the book, is with us every time. And it's in the act of writing this as we read it. I don't know. It's On one level, it's stupid and really simple. But on the other level, I think it's a really cool way to look at things. That's just me. I'm an English teacher. Going on. Anyway, lastly, we're close. On 244, 245, uh, he talks about at night, uh, he would have dreams about her, right? And it's I think the storytelling started with these dreams. She was dead, I understood that, after all I'd seen her body, and yet even a nine-year-old, I had come up and began to practice the magic of stories. Some I just dreamed up, others I wrote down, the scenes and the dialogue. He's been doing this ever since he was a kid, which I think is wonderful. Anyway, I'll stop talking, I just think it's a really cool book. Um, uh, once, I remember, as we went ice skating late at night, tracing loops and circles under the yellow floodlights, later we sat by a wood stove in the warming house, all alone, and after a while I asked her what it was like to be dead. Apparently, Linda thought this was a silly question. She smiled. Do I look dead? I told her no. She looked terrific. I waited a moment, then asked again, and she made a little sigh. Well, right now, she said, I'm not dead. But when I am, it's like, I don't know. I guess it's like being in a book that's nobody, that nobody's reading. Every time we tell the stories, we open the book, and then she gets to live again. I don't know. I think it's wonderful. Lastly, uh, right at the very end of this, it said, um, uh, I loved her, and then she died. And yet right here, in the spell of memory and imagination, I can still see her as if through ice, as if gazing into some other world, a place where there are no brain tumors and no funeral homes, where there are no bodies at all. I can see Kaiwa too and Ted Lavender and Kurt Lemon, and sometimes I can even see Timmy skating hands with Linda under the yellow floodlights. I'm young and happy. I'll never die. Just as we all felt when we were little. Not all of us, but lots of us. I'm skimming across the surface of my own history, moving fast, riding the melt blade me melt beneath the blades doing loops and spins and then i take a high leap into the dark and come down 30 years later i realize it is tim trying to save timmy's life for the story in the same way that if i told you stories about ninth nine-year-old nick because otherwise no one's going to know nine-year-old nick my parents do right but the, my one of my parents is not with us anymore see even i use that euphemism not with us passed away these things which just make death seem a little bit more palatable anyway uh, that's it for the book. So on Monday or Tuesday, Monday, I will have a lecture where I just kind of talk through essay topics for you. And then that'll be about it. Next week will be primarily a work period. So we have a uh, optional discussion tomorrow and then uh, sometime next week. So thank you.